and we're live hello hello this is going to be the daily bread for march 30th Getting late start as always but that's okay and we are definitely officially live oh, oh, oh. okay and uh did my audio check and everything i'm gonna go ahead and get my night pills taken really super fast toby get out you always do this as soon as i get ready to start with my water Get out. I am not dealing with y'all today. I am just so not in the mood to deal with these cats. Anyway, so as soon as I start my video, here comes Toby. But I'm mad at him right now because he was on the bed bathing. Bella was sleeping in her little box bed I made for her, right? Because she's already starting to kind of nest. So there's a place where she likes to lay on a towel that I put down for because it's a super soft towel. It's usually my pool towel, but I'll let her use it. And so I found a perfect box for us, not too shallow, perfect, right? She laying there sleeping so good. And for some unknown reason to mankind, he decides to jump down off the bed, run over there, and snatch her up by her neck. Now, granted, she's pregnant. She's not in heat. He's been fixed for a good solid month at least now. So he's not in heat, and there is absolutely no reason for her to be biting and attacking her like that. I mean, he was more violent about it now than he was when he wasn't fixed, and made her scream. It hurt her. Well, that made me mad, so I'm not really real fond of hit Toby right now. That was sad. And sometimes he starts biting her on her belly because she's actually, I think, well... She feels like it, but Brandon said he's felt like she's starting to get a little bit of milk. And so, I don't know if he smells that. I don't know what he's doing, but I know I have one thing. When she get ready to have those babies, I won't trust him around those babies if he's acting like this. I'm afraid he might be one of those tom cats that kill the males, you know what I mean? Sorry. Oh... Those potassium pills are really hard to swallow. I think my throat is actually sore from it. And then I have to take five a day, and I usually do two in the morning and then three at night. I think I'm going to switch it <laughs> to two at night because they're massive pills. So here we are. Okay, so I got that out of the way. I think I have all my pills taken, my blood pressure pills. And by the way, since Doc doubled my blood pressure medicine to 50 milligrams a day, it's been staying beautiful numbers like it was before I ever had a blood pressure problem. It's been awesome. Okay, so anywho, so for March 30th, if you go online to the ourdailybread.org and, and look, it's, it, I'm reading from March 30th, this daily bread. Yes, yeah, for behind, but you know what? As long as we're in his word every day, who cares, right? And so the insight scripture is actually Isaiah 53, 4 through 7 and 10 through 12. But you cannot read Isaiah 53, where it talks about the suffering servant, without reading 52, the last three verses, because that, that is where it actually begins to speak of him. And also, if you're familiar with the song, I Am Free, from the Newsboys, one of their live concerts, I think it was in Houston, pardon me, uh, he starts ministering during a, a praise, what I call a praise break, some call it an instrumental break, I call it a praise break. And he starts quoting Isaiah 52, 13 through 15, and part of 53. So, that's how I know. That's how I learned that that goes with the 53. So, that's kind of a cool way to learn it, right? That was the song that uh, the uh, contemporary Christian band that we have, but we're kind of like in limbo right now. We have a drummer, and we have James, but we don't have a bass player uh, or, or a keyboard player or, or even a rhythm player we don't have anything else right now my nephew could play bass but he's a truck driver so he's like never around so that's not going to work and mm, pete Pryor, who's one of the original lost and found members he just had to have like was it triple bypass surgery or something and he lives out of state but once he gets all healed up and i know he will satan attacked him as soon as he was like wanting to you know, join back with the Lost and Found, and he was going to move back to Oklahoma and everything. Bam! He got knocked down. Boy, Satan got his health good. Well, not good, bad. And so, 
But once he gets healed up, he's been back to home and he's going to be ready to go. Yeah, Pete was the original guitar player for Lost and Found. Bill Dillard played the drums. I was vocals, of course. And at the time, Chilled though, we called him Chilled though. He has, his real name is like about 49 letters long. He's Hispanic. It's a really long Spaniard name. Uh, but anyways, we called him Chilled though. Uh, for a nickname and he was the bass player and he would sing sometimes with he would sing with me too so. anyway that's enough of that so maybe if it's god's will we'll get lost and found together again that would be nice we don't do the uh they don't do the um lot and strike force anymore though you know so that's kind of a bummer that that that's okay though um it got to where it wasn't as much of a joy for me anymore anyway my daughter quit singing with me so that kind of killed it for me too anyway let's do this shall we have already talked six minutes all right so fathers we get into your word as we always should do father first and foremost thank you for waking me up today waking us up today to see another day and father i pray that we used this day to give you glory and to bring glory to your kingdom let each day that you wake us up father to remember to ask you what it is we can do for you today father and to try to keep focused on our mindset to be to be about your business and doing your will father and adding to your kingdom by planting as many seeds as we can while there's time because we know time is so very short father as more and more russians surround israel and and build up in the red sea and so forth lord we see these prophecies just coming to fruition and just setting up in place father we know that ezekiel 38 and 39 armageddon uh, i mean that uh, war gog and magog is just on the horizon so we know that the uh, the peace agreement is going to be any time and i know that for those that believe in the pre-trib rapture because i do believe father this the, the restrainer that has to be moved out of the way so that the lawless one the son of perdition can be revealed is the holy spirit that resides in the believer and once he's moved out of the way then evil will be let loose full volume and he will be allowed to overcome the saints father there are so many people that have no idea that what is what's coming they don't even know the true definition of evil father they have no idea what the bible says and i'm sure that's just t tip of the iceberg of the horrors that are going to be let loose on this earth when that bottomless pit is opened father help us to to tell people about Jesus and about the good news of salvation through your son. Oh, is that water okay? Is that? Well, there's time. There's so many fathers that, don't, that have not heard the gospel. Put them in our path, Father, so that we can share it. Let us be the salt and the light of the earth that Jesus called us to be. As we read your word, Father, as always, we ask that you let the words just leap off the page. Let it grow on the inside of us. Help us to digest it. Just like Isaiah ate the scrolls, and, or Ezekiel ate the scrolls. I forgot who. <laughs> I forgot which one it was. Ate the scrolls, the flying scroll. I can't remember. But you know, Father, you know my heart. You know what I'm meaning. Help us to digest your words so that we will have them in our hearts to share with others. And we know the Holy Spirit will speak through us the words that need to be said for people you've put in our path. But, Father, we do want to grow in our knowledge and wisdom, our discernment and our understanding as we study your word because we know your word is the living word father for we know in john 1 it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god with him 
he was with him in the beginning. And we know that the word is Jesus, Yeshua, our, Mess our Messiah. Because in John 1, 14 it says, and the word became flesh and made us dwelling among us. So Father, use us as willing vessels to do your will. And we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So, the song of the suffering servant is Isaiah 53, 4 through 7, 10 through 12. It's actually all of 53, I think, but we'll go with this. The song of the suffering servant, we most often associate with Isaiah 53, and he says it here, but I already knew this, actually begins in the previous chapter at verse 13. And even Pastor Chuck, when he was preaching, and covering this stuff. He even said you have to start in 52, 13. You can't, can't not. There the servant is introduced as one who is wise and who will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted, 52 verse 13. If that final phrase sounds familiar, that's because it's one of Isaiah's favorite ways to describe his encounters with Yahweh, God himself, in Isaiah 6, 1. Toby, you better be nice to her. Y'all can share the box, but you'd be nice. That's a good brother. They're so sweet, they're sharing the box now. And, I, and she's bathing him like he's her baby. <laughs> in Isaiah 6, 1, the prophet recounts seeing the God of Israel in his temple, high, room, and exalted, Nasa. In 52, 13, the NIV uh, translates the same two Hebrew words as raised and lifted up. Isaiah associates the exaltation of the suffering servant with the very person of Yahweh, looking ahead to the Son himself, Jesus. So right there, he's showing two persons, one God. Amen? Two people of the three person of the triune of the Godhead. Anyways, this was written by Jed Ostrich. I guess that's how you say his name. That's how I'm saying it. Okay, so Isaiah 52, 13 through 15. You didn't have this on the daily bread thing, but I put it in there because you got to read it. You can't not read it. I almost put Psalm 22 in there, but we're not talking about the crucifixion part. So I get it. But you can always go read Psalm 22 because the verses 1 through 21 talks about the suffering servant. Where Jesus starts out saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, and it makes it sound like God turned away from him and uh, forsook him and all this. But then 22 to the end says, you did not forsake me. You did not turn your face from me. You did not, you know. And so it's, yeah, and then this is, it has a happy ending. So you always got to read Psalm 22 all the way through. Isaiah 52, 13 through 15. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Just as many were astonished at you, or astonied, some versions say. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. All right now, Toby. Don't distort it. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him. For what had not been told them, they shall see. And what they had not heard, they shall consider. And then Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 7. Toby. Toby. <laughs> and then verses 10 through 12. I just shot water and I hit him. I didn't even touch Bella. But she shot out there like it got her. Verses 10 through 12. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. Get out of her box, dude. And he was bruised for our iniquities. Out of her box. Uh, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. And we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. 
He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. Toby, you start biting that box, and I'm going to, I'm going to, as soon as I read this verse, I'm going to put him out of the room, because he's going to be a problem. In fact, I'm going to do that now, because I'm already losing my place. You know what? You need to just leave, because you're distracting, and you're interrupting my video. You are a little thing of Satan. Go. Goodbye. He was wet. <laughs> Yuck. Forgot I sprayed him. All right. When you, okay. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief when you make his soul an offering for sin. That, that just breaks my heart. To It's not like God is demented or evil, that it pleased him to bruise him. It what You know what it means there, right? It, it means that it pleased him that his son was obedient and did not sin, and he was able to take the place to complete the price of sin, the wages of sin, which was death for the world, so that through his death, burial, and resurrection, the relationship with mankind could be restored with God as it should have been, as it was supposed to be from the beginning before Adam and Eve brought sin in. Amen. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many. For he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Father. The Passion of the Christ. The Passion of Christ. Before Jim Caviezel played Jesus in the film The Passion of the Christ, which his initials were JC and he was 33 when he did the film. That's cool. <laughs> Director Mel Gibson warned that the role would be extremely difficult and could negatively impact his career. I actually ended up buying the entire, every season of Persons of Interest that Jim Caviezel did sometime later. That was such an excellent series. I hated it that it ended. That was such a good show. Anyway, he took on the role anyway, saying, I think we have to make it, even if it's difficult. Uh -oh, sorry. During the filming, Caviezel was struck by lightning twice, I think, actually. Lost 45 pounds and was accidentally whipped during the flogging scene. Actually, more than that. When he was on the final scene on the cross, you know, he had that bluish tint color to his body. That was him. That wasn't makeup. It was like, in fact, he had to have like some sort of heart surgery after the movie was finished because of his health. Uh, I don't know. You have to watch the. You have to watch that interview where he's at. I forgot what church he's he's at. But yeah, I have to find that. I have to find the interview and I'll put it in the description in the comments. It's excellent because what he says at the end, so awesome, man, so so awesome, man. I have to go watch that now. But anyways, I'm sorry. Let me keep going. Um, afterwards, he stated, "I didn't want people to see me. I just wanted them to see." Jesus and I remember well you just have to watch the interview because he explains it even better I'm not even gonna I'm not even gonna take anything from it by trying to explain what he said Conversions will happen through that the actor that played Judas Iscariot After he did that that scene where you know if you haven't seen it I may spoiler okay, but there's this one scene where after you know They're taking Jesus away and he sees like this demon face in this rock right and he runs away the act, act the character does Jesus is scary. The actor ended up giving his life to Jesus after making that movie. He was an a, like an atheist or a non-believer before that, but after making that movie, it touched him so deeply that he gave his life to Christ, and he is like a believer now. 
I know after I saw that movie, we went as soon as it hit the theaters to support Mel Gibson in the, the movie. And I know all the way home from the theater, I was bawling like a baby because I'd never really give it deep thought about just what he went through. And trust me, after listening to doctors explain just how bad he was beaten, right? That just barely even grazed the surface of how badly our Savior was beaten. He was beaten so bad with that cat of nine tails. The flesh, the muscle, and the sinew that holds the muscle to, on, you know, to the bone was gone. His organs were literally exposed on his back and in his front. I mean, you could see his organs. I mean, when it says his visage was none, you know, it was so marred that couldn't even look at him because he didn't even look like a man anymore. He was beaten so bad. They beat him so bad that, you know, any other person, he, they would have been dead just from the beating. And they only did 39 stripes or, you know, sw uh, you know hit, hit him 39 times because they knew 40 would kill. They 39 and knew they would recover. Did you know that every disease known to mankind comes from one of 39 lines. So when it says in 53.5 that, and by his stripes we are healed, those 39 stripes on his body, literally, literally, we are healed. Amen? Physically and spiritually. But I digress. Let me just keep going. Because we're not talking about that part. I'm sorry. Uh. But he didn't want them to see him. They wanted them to see Jesus. They didn't want to see it as an actor playing Jesus. They wanted to actually envision what it was like for Jesus. And I think he did a very good job of that. Conversions will happen through that. The film deeply affected Caviezel and others on the set. And only God knows how many of the millions who watched it. And still to this day that watch it experience changed lives the passion of Christ refers to the time of Jesus' greatest suffering from his triumphal entry on Palm Sunday and including his betrayal mocking flogging and crucifixion accounts are found in all four Gospels and in Isaiah 53 his suffering and his outcome are foretold he was pierced for our transgressions he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, or by his stripes, we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. But because of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, we can have peace with God. His suffering opened the way for us to be with him. It's 1010. Our own righteousness is as filthy as rags no amount of good works no amount of I'm a good person I've never murdered anybody is filthy rags but if you give your life to Christ if you believe on him and confess and repent of your sins and accept him as your Lord and Savior and ask him to wash away your sins with his precious blood that was shed on Calvary God will look at you and see the blood of his son on you and he will see you as righteous then but only only through the blood of Christ John 14 6 Jesus says I am the way the truth and the life and no one gets to the Father but through him Jesus is the only way to the Father no amount of works will get you into heaven no amount of works. This was written by Allison Keita. What aspect of Christ's life most impacts you? How does his suffering affect you? <laughs> because we as people suck and we continue to sin and put him back on that cross. Every time we sin, we're driving those nails in his hand and feet. 
every time we sin, we're grieving the Holy Spirit, which resides in the believer. Knowing that if there was one person that needed redemption, he would get, he would come right back to earth and he would do it all over again for one person if it was necessary. He, I know he would. And to know the suffering, just from what I've heard and seen and researched and studied that others have talked about, the amount of suffering he got, he, that he went through, and he knew, he knew this before he even came to earth. He, that's exactly why he came to earth, was to preach the gospel, right? He came to save the world through ministering to his people first and then by dying for all of us, everyone. Precious Savior, it's hard to express how grateful we are that you suffered, died, and rose again for us. Thank you. You know, I was watching a video today, a little TikTok or, or reel or whatever it was, a little short videos, you know, and it says, what type of believer are you going to be on that first day, the first day you see Jesus? And it shows different types of, you know, different scenes of people hugging Jesus, right? And the one where Mary of Magdala in The Chosen, where she had gone back to, you know, her old self uh, because that, that demoniac showed up and it like flipped her out and she went back and she was gambling and she was this... And she was like, I'm broken again, and, you know, he fixed me once, you know, and she didn't think he would fix her again, and he, she figured she messed up, and that was the end of it. And so she, you know, they, Matthew and, and Simon took her back, and she, you know, was telling Jesus how sorry she was, and, ooh, he told her that, did you think that you wouldn't ever have this happen again? Did you think that you would never sin again? You know, did you think that, you know, the, you know of course, you know, you can't, you know, it's, it's going to happen. You can't, and basically in so many words he was saying, you can't, it's, it's, you can't not do it because of the sin blood in you, you know, is basically what he was saying. He says, but the Father and I, all we want is your heart. And we already have that, that's why he's telling her. And so, you know, she told him she was sorry, and he said, I forgive you. He says, it's all over now, it's in the past. And in when they were filming that scene, the Elizabeth Tabish that was actually doing that scene, she just like dove into the actor's arms that plays Jesus, Jonathan Remy, and started crying on his shoulder, just bawling your eyes out, you know, as if he really was, you know, because, you know, like what we would do if that were really Jesus. And he was saying to us, I forgive you. It's, it's over. It's for, it's done. You know, in the past, it's, it's over, right? Don't, it's forgotten. And she just dove in his arms and just started crying all over her shoulder, probably snotting everywhere. That would be me. That's going to be me the first day I see Jesus. I already know it. I mean, I'm already pictured. I'm going to run and jump in his arms and be all happy and laughing. If I'm not on my face, I'm going to be like Elizabeth Tabish was in that scene. And I'll put that scene, too, in the comments because that's such a powerful scene. Because I bawl like a little baby every time I see that. But I need to quit talking so much and just get through this. But the punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. Isaiah 53.5 Now if you want to do further study uh, and read I Am The Way, The Amazing Claims of Jesus, I did put that link in the description with the other uh, links that's, you know, for the resources. So Judges 9. Okay, let's do this. Alright, so we are now to Abimelech. The wind is the same. Still debated. 
Okay, so the events of Judges 9 occurred within one generation of Gideon overthrowing the Midianites in Judges 7 and 8. And then where Gideon's sons lived near Ophrah, not on the map, which was in the territory of Manasseh, Jotham addressed the men of Shechem from Mount Gerizim. Abimelech was killed in Thebes. Thebes, however you say that. Okay, and the characters, is, we know who Gideon is, the fifth judge of Israel. Abimelech is the son of Gideon with his concubine. He's usually counted as the sixth judge of Israel, although some dispute his judgeship because he was not a godly man. Jotham, the youngest son of Gideon, and Gaal, 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 I don't know how to say that. Well, a man of Shechem who rebelled against Abimelech's rule. Oh, what is all this stuff? Uh oh. He's trying to call me this night. What? Out of here. They still have not paid. I guess I'll get paid tomorrow. They were processing it. They're not doing it fast enough, dang it. I always just have small heart attacks until I see my money loaded on the card. <sighs> my kittens are out of dry food and, and I mean, the cats have dry food, but they, I usually buy pure and kitten chow for the babies up until they're a year old, or, or pregnant mommies, or nursing mommies, and of course kittens. Uh, so G-A-A-L, Pro. Search, down hole. Really? Okay, I'm not sure what's going on with the uh, with the internet. Brandon needs to either play his video game or watch videos on his phone, but he needs to quit doing both. Because he's just slowing everything down. It's really making me mad. I know it's not my phone. Okay. That game's going to come off. <sighs> I'm almost to the point I don't care how it's pronounced now. Because I just want to get on. My gosh, it's already been 30 minutes. <sighs> Why won't you play it? Okay, you know what? I'm just going to go on. This is really starting to irritate me. Alright, so the outline Abimelech made king in Shechem, verses 1 through 6. Abimelech, the son of Gideon, went to his mother's room. Oh, looking at oh. to pronounce Gaul. 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 Okay. The Thank name. you. Bye bye. Peace. Oh, peace. Alright. Uh. Abimelech, the son of Gideon, went to his mother's relative in Shechem and convinced them to make him their king. The men of Shechem gave him 70 pieces of silver with which he hired reckless men to kill all 70 of his brothers, the sons of Gideon. That, you know that prince in uh, Egypt, uh, Saudi Arabia who had like all of his brothers arrested or whatever? And now he has like, he's like next to heir in a throne or something. Sound kind of familiar? Interesting. Huh. Only Jotham, Gideon's youngest son, managed to escape. Wow. So he had reckless men to kill all 70 of his brothers, the sons of Gideon. Only Jotham, Gideon's youngest son, managed to escape. Jotham's parable of the trees, verses 7 through 21. When Jotham, Jotham learned the men of Shechem made Abimelech their king, he went to the top of Mount Gerizim and spoke a parable to them. The parable was about the trees trying to find their king. They went to the olive tree and asked him to be their king, but the olive tree didn't want to give up all of production to become king. They went to the fig tree, but the fig tree responded similarly. They went to the grapevine. Make sure y'all are hearing me. I forgot to check that, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. But the grapevine didn't want to be king either. Finally, they went to the thorn bush, and the worthless bush accepted the job. Jotham compared the actions of Shechem to the actions of the trees. 
The house of Gideon had been full of honorable men, but the men of Shechem selected the worthless brother to lead them. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay, Shechem is destroyed and Abimelech is killed, verses 22 through 57. I'm just saying the other chapter only has like 17 verses, so I think that's why we're only reading two again. Abimelech ruled Israel for three years, but God sent an evil spirit to trouble the relationship between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. The men of Shechem shifted their allegiance from Abimelech to a new man in town, Gaul, the son of Ebed. Gaul plotted to overthrow Abimelech and make himself king, but his plot was leaked to Abimelech. Abimelech set up an ambush around Shechem during the night. When the men of the city woke up, Abimelech's men attacked. Gaul fought against him, but lost. The next day, Abimelech attacked the city again. He destroyed everything and sowed the city with salt. The last stronghold of the city was known as the Tower of Shechem, and the leaders retreated there as a last resort. Abimelech set the tower on fire and killed the thousand men and women inside. He then fought against the city of Thebes, which also had a tower. A woman in the tower threw a millstone on him and crushed his skull. Jeez. As he was dying, he asked the servant to kill him with a sword so he wouldn't be remembered as having been killed by a woman. When the men of Israel learned Abimelech was dead, they stopped fighting and returned to their homes. Thus God returned the evil of Abimelech, which he committed against his father in killing his 70 brothers. Jeez. The application, do not be sloppy, desperate, or impatient when selecting leaders. <coughs> Let's go, Brennan. Because the outcome can be devastating. Hmm. This chapter is a case study in bad leadership. When bad leaders are given control, it's difficult to get them out of leadership. This is an important lesson for the church, and I suspect it's part of the reason God's qualifications for elders is so high. It's better to wait patiently for qualified men than to appoint a thorn bush as your king. Amen. I love my church. I love my church. I so love my church. They are so good there. Okay. Abimelech's conspiracy. Then Abimelech, the son of Jerubal, went to Shechem to his mother's brothers and spoke with them and with all the family of the house of his mother's father saying please speak in the hearing of all the men of Shechem well, which is better for you that all 70 of the sons of Jerubal reign over you or that one reign over you remember that I am your own flesh and bone flesh and bone hmm and his mother's brother spoke all these words concerning him in the hearing of all the men of Shechem. And their heart was inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, He is our brother. So they gave him seventy shekels of silver from the temple of Baal Berth, with which Abimelech hired worthless and sh reckless men for seventy shekels. Of and they followed him. Then he went to his father's house at Ophrah, and killed his brothers, the seventy sons of Jerubal. Jerubal, I don't know how you say that, on one stone. But Jotham, the youngest son of Jerubal, was left, but because he hid himself. I'm not kid. Hmm. And all the men of Shechem gathered together, all the, all of Beth Milo, and they went and made Abimelech king beside the terebinth tree at the pillar that was in Shechem. The parable of the trees. Now when they told Jotham, he went and stood on top of Mount Gerizim and lifted his voice and cried out and he said to them, listen to me you men of Shechem, that God may listen to you. The trees once went forth to anoint a king over them and they said to the olive tree, reign over us. But the olive tree said to them, should I cease giving my oil with which they honor God and men and go to sway over trees? Then the tree said to the fig tree, You come and reign over us. But the fig tree said to them, Should I cease my sweetness and my good fruit and go to sway over trees? I remember hearing this before. Then the tree said to the vine, You come and reign over us. But the vine said to them, Should I cease my new wine, which cheers both God and men, and go to sway over trees? 
Then all the trees said to the bramble, You come and reign over us. And the bramble said to the trees, If in truth you anoint me as king over you, then come and take shelter in my shade. But if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Now therefore, if you have acted in truth and sincerity in making Abimelech king, and if you have dealt well with Jerubbaal and his house, and have done to him as he deserves, for my father fought for you, risked his life, and delivered you out of the hand of Midian, but you have risen up against my father's house this day, and killed his seventy sons on one stone, and made Abimelech the son of his female servant, king over the men of Shechem, because he is your brother, if then you have acted in truth and sincerity with Jerubbaal and this and with his house this day, then rejoice in Abimelech, and let him also rejoice in you. But if not, let fire come from Abimelech and devour the men of Shechem and Beth Milo, and let fire come from the men of Shechem and from Beth Milo and devour Abimelech. And Jotham ran away and fled, and he went to Beer and dwelt there for fear of Abimelech his brother. <laughs> downfall of Abimelech. And after Abimelech had reigned over Israel three years, God sent a spirit of ill will between Abimelech and the sons of Shechem. And the men of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech, that the crime done to the seventy sons of Jerubbaal might be settled, and their blood be laid on Abimelech, their brother, who killed them, and on the men of Shechem, who aided him in the killing of his brothers. And the men of Shechem set men in ambush against him on the tops of the mountains, and they robbed all who passed by them along that way, and it was told Abimelech. Now Gaul, the son of Ebed, came with his brothers and went over to Shechem. And the men of Shechem put their confidence in him. So they went out into the fields and gathered grapes from their vineyards, and trod them and made merry. <laughs> and they went into the house of their god, and ate and drank and cursed Abimelech. Then Gaul, the son of Ebed, said, Who is Abimelech, and who is Shechem, that we should serve him? Is he not the son of Jerubbaal? And is not Zebel, his officer, serve the men of Hamer, the father of Shechem? But why should we serve him? If only this people were under my authority, then I would remove Abimelech. So he said to Abimelech, Increase your army and come out. When Zebel, the ruler of the city, heard the words of Gaul, the son of Ebed, his anger was aroused, and he sent messengers to Abimelech secretly, saying, Take note, Gaul, the son of Ebed, and his brothers have come to Shechem, and here they are, fortifying the city against you. Now, therefore, get up by night, you and the people who are with you, and lie in wait in the field. And it shall be, as soon as the sun is up in the morning, that you shall rise early and rush upon the city. And when he and the people who are with him come out against you, you may then do to them as you find opportunity. So Abimelech and all the people who were with him rose by night and lay in wait against Shechem in four companies. When Gaul, the son of Ebed, went out and stood in the entrance to the city gate, Abimelech and the people who were with him rose from lying in wait. And when Gaul saw the people, he said to Zebul, Look, people are coming down from the tops of the mountains. But Zebul said to him, You see the shadows of the mountains as if they were men. So Gaul spoke again and said, See, people are coming down from the center of the land, and another company is coming from the diviner's terebinth tree. Then Zebul said to him, Where indeed is your mouth now, with which you said, Who is Abimelech, that we should serve him? Are not these the people whom you despise? Go out, if you will, and fight with them now. Yeah, put your money where your mouth is, buddy. Hmm. So Gaul went out, hmm. leading them into Shechem, and fought with Abimelech. And Abimelech chased him, and he fled from him, and many fell wounded to the very entrance of the gate. Then Abimelech dwelt at Arumah, and Zebul drove out Gaul and his brothers, so they would not dwell in Shechem. And it came about on the next day that the people went out into the field, and they told Abimelech. So he took his people, divided them into three companies, and lay in wait in the field. And he looked, and there were the people coming out of the city. And he rose against them and attacked them. Then Abimelech and the company that was with him rushed forward and stood at the entrance of the gate of the city. 
and the other two companies rushed upon all who were in the fields and killed them. So Abimelech fought against the city all that day. He took the city and killed the people who were in it, and he demolished the city and sowed it with salt. I'm not sure what that means, but okay. Now when all the men of the Tower of Shechem heard that, had heard that, they entered the stronghold of the temple of the god Barim, Bereth, I mean, Bereth or whatever. And it was told that Abimelech, and it was told Abimelech that all the men of the Tower of Shechem were gathered together. Okay. Then Abimelech went up to Mount Zalman, and all the people who were with him, and Abimelech took an axe in his hand and cut down a bough from the trees and took it and laid it on his shoulder. Then he said to the people who were with him, What you have seen me do, make haste and do as I have done. So each of the people likewise cut down his own bow and followed Abimelech and put them against the stronghold and set the stronghold on fire above them so that all the people of the Tower of Shechem died, about a thousand men and women. Okay. Then Abimelech went to Thebes, Thebes or whatever, Thebes, and he encamped against Thebes and took it. But there was a strong tower in the city, and all the men and women, all the people of the city, fled there and shut themselves in. Then they went up to the top of the tower. So Abimelech came as far as the tower and fought against it. And he drew near the door of the tower to burn it with fire. But a certain woman dropped an upper millstone on Abimelech's head and crushed his skull. Then he called quickly to the young man, his armor bearer, and said to him, Draw your sword and kill me, lest men say of me, a woman killed him. So his young man thrust him through, and he died. And when the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, they departed every man to his place. Thus God repaid the wickedness of Abimelech, which he had done to, uh, which he had done to his father by killing his seventy brothers. And all the evil of the men of Shechem God returned on their own heads, and on them came the curse of Jotham, the son of Jerubbaal. Judges 10. Okay, so now we're uh, featuring Tola and Jer. Jar. Jar? Jar. I don't know. I know, I know Jairus is spelled J-A-I-R-U-S and it's Jairus. So I wonder if it's Jar. But I think, come on, phone. What is your problem? Ah. A I R. Come on, you can do it. A I R. Pronunciation. I hit your stupid phone. I need a new phone. Every time I type pronunciation, I think of that song. Anticipation. Yeah, anyway, sorry. Dyer. Dyer. That's a long one. Really? <sighs> okay, well, while we're waiting for it, I'll go ahead and start. Hush, this is Jack. Oh. said us. Jair. Jair. Okay. Or. Thank you. Bye. Okay. When's the same? <clears throat> Judges 10 covers at least 63 years of Israelite history. Tola judged 23 years. Jair judged 22 years. That's only 55 years. Okay, and the Philistines and Ammonites oppressed Israel 18 years. Okay. Oh, 45 and 2. Right, okay. Do your math, Debbie. Come on, you better not. Okay. Most of Judges 10 centers around the land of Gilead. Gilead was on the east side of the Jordan River. Gad's land and the southern part of Manasseh's territory were in Gilead. Okay, so we have Tola, the seventh judge of Israel. He was the son of Pua, son of Dodo. Jair, the eighth judge of Israel, he was a man from Gilead on the east side of the Jordan River. And then the Philistines and the Ammonites, they crushed and oppressed the people of Israel for 18 years. Okay. So on the outline, we have Tola, the seventh judge of Israel, verses 1 and 2. After Abimelech died, Tola judged Israel for 23 years. Tola was from the tribe of Issachar. Jair, the eighth judge of Israel, verses three through five. After Tola, Jair judged Israel for twenty-two years. 
He had 30 signs. He rode on 30 donkeys and had 30 cities. Oh, wow. That's a lot of signs. No, it wasn't from one woman, though. Thank goodness. The Israelites turned away from God again. Verses 6 through 18. The Israelites stopped worshiping God and devoted themselves to the idols of the pagan nations around them. Good Lord. God was angry with them and allowed the Philistines and the Ammonites to oppress the people of Gilead. The Ammonites also made war with the Israelites in Judah, Benjamin, and Ephraim. The Israelites cried out to God, confessing their sins and asking for help, but the Lord wouldn't listen. He told them to direct their pleas to their idols and see if they would help. Wow. In penance, the people got rid of all their idols and started worshiping God according to the law Moses had given them. Very good. God's heart softened towards them until he could no longer endure the misery of Israel. <laughs> Mercy of God shines through. The chapter ends with Israel's enemies preparing for battle in Gilead and the people of Israel searching for a man to lead their army against the Ammonites. Application. The decisions you make today and your commitment to God today will affect the lives of your posterity. Israel was surrounded by and tempted by pagan nations because their parents and grandparents failed to obey God and throw them out of the land. Yes, the current generation was responsible for their own sins, but their circumstances were negatively impacted by their parents. When it comes to serving God, set your children up for success. Do the best you can to serve God today so you don't create hazards your children will trip on later. Man. So, yeah, okay. I'll close that. Yeah, it will help. All right, so Judges 10, starting with Tola. Oh, one verse for Tola. Wow. After Abimelech there arose to save Israel, Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, a man of Issachar. And he dwelt in Shemir in the mountains of Ephraim. He judged Israel 23 years, and he died and was buried in Shemir. Wow. Okay. And then Jair. 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 In Brazilian, the president of Brazil is named that way. Jair. Okay. After him arose Jair, a Gileadite, and he judged Israel 22 years. Now he had 30 sons who rode on 30 donkeys, and they also had 30 towns, which are called Havath Jair to this day, which are in the land of Gilead. And Jair died and was buried in Canaan. Israel oppressed again. Then the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtoreths, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the people of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines. And they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. So the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the people of Ammon. From that year they harassed and oppressed the children of Israel for 18 years. All the people of Israel who were on the other side of the Jordan in the land of the Amorites in Gilead. Moreover, the people of Ammon crossed over the Jordan to fight against Judah also, against Benjamin, and against the house of Ephraim. So that Israel was severely distressed. Now this thought just came to my mind. Now it may just be me because I'm crazy. But you think about 18 years they were oppressed because they again turned their back on God and started worshiping these false gods, right? Now, when they, you know, they kept killing the prophets, they kept killing the, you know, the, the parable of the, the vineyard owner, right, that Jesus tells. And then they killed his son, right, they killed the Messiah. Well, they didn't kill him, he came to die for our sins. But as far as they're concerned, they killed Jesus. And you know, as far as God's concerned, they, 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 they think they killed, the, killed his son, right? And so it's, you know, been almost 2,000 years since, you know, as far as Jesus died and rose again. So God is, right now, he's letting them get their hand, butts handed to him, and they're getting oppressed, and they're getting beat up. But God still has the final say, and he still has some unfinished business with his people for what they did to Jesus, you know, to Yeshua. So... You think if this is this is a little punishment that they keep getting, like with the Babylonians and Rome and so forth, because of their disobedience and serving false gods? How bad do you think the wrath of God is going to be?
when he decides to punish them for killing his prophets and then his son. Just saying. Think about it. I mean, that just hit me when I'm reading this. Verse 10. Uh, or no, no, no. Um, from that, okay, verse 8. From that year they harassed and oppressed the children of Israel for 18 years. All the children of Israel who were on the other side of the Jordan in the land of the Amorites and Gilead. Moreover, the people of Ammon crossed over the Jordan to fight against Judah also, against Benjamin and against the house of Ephraim, so that Israel was severely distressed. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, saying, We have sinned against you, because we have both forsaken our God and served the Baals. So the Lord said to the children of Israel, Did I not deliver you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites and from the people of Ammon and from the Philistines? Also the Sidonians and the Amalekites and Mayanites oppressed you, and you cried out to me, and I delivered you from their hand. Yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore I will deliver you no more. Go and cry out to the gods which you have chosen. Let them deliver you in your time of distress. And the children of Israel said to the Lord, We have sinned. Do to us whatever seems best to you. Only deliver us this day, we pray. So they put away the foreign gods from among them and served the Lord. And his soul could no longer endure the misery of Israel. Then the people of Ammon gathered together and encamped in Gilead. And the children of Israel assembled together and encamped in Mizpah. And the people, the leaders of Gilead, said to one another, Who is the man who will begin the, the fight against the people of Ammon? He shall be head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. And that is the end of this half of the reading. God, it's been an hour because I talk too much. I am so sorry, guys. Okay, so I'll go ahead and end this one. And then I'll be back and we'll read Luke 5, 17 through 39. So, shalom, shalom. And I shall return in just a couple of minutes. I just have to copy some notes here and then paste it over. So, I'll be right back. And I'll have to go anywhere, so I'll be right back.